The work-life balance is a thing that I've heard many people talk about over the years. And, you know, it's just an area that we are existing in. The point is we have to get paid so we can, you know, have money to take care of the things that we need to. And that is going to impact our life. It's also going to change the way that we may behave when we come home from work. Sometimes we're not even feeling fulfilled in our job, and that's going to apply to some of the stressors. There's also the dual income family where both the husband and the wife are working. And I know many of you listening can relate to that. And that brings its own work-life stress. So today, what we're going to do is unpack the work-life stress in marriage. Stay tuned. Welcome back to another podcast right here on the Husband Coaches Corner. I know I've been away for a little while, but I'm back for at least a short period of time. I can't tell you for how long. Things are just hectic. In fact, the whole reason that I'm doing this work-life balance thing and episode is because I myself have been impacted by it. So how else can I come to the uh, the audience here on this podcast without talking about the things that impact us every single day? And let me tell you, my work-life balance has gotten hectic, which is why I've kind of had to step away a little bit. You know, I'm going to bring some content as best I can, and I don't know what the schedule will be. So just stay on the lookout for content. Now, with that being said, if you want to get a hold of me, or if you want to get in contact with me, you can check the show notes. My email address is down there. That's probably the best way of getting a hold of me. You can ask questions and I'll do my best to answer them via email. And if it's something that we need to arrange a phone call for, then we can do that. Again, all within this work-life balance concept. So I don't think I really need to explain what the work-life balance is. I think many of us already kind of understand that. And uh, yeah, so I won't go crazy deep into it. But for those of you who are probably like, all right, Chris, what are you talking about work-life balance? Well, sometimes uh, or we have to exist, right? So many of us, we have jobs and then we also have a life. And you can easily get out of balance where you are doing so much at work that you forget about life or you have so much going on in your life, like issues that are happening in your marriage that start to impact your work. And you got to find a really nice balance. Now, I'll be honest, there's kind of this is kind of a myth. You will always be at odds with one or the other. What I really want you to uh, gain from today's episode is the idea of seasons, right? We're going to talk about this throughout the podcast. I really only have two points to make. I want you to think about seasons when we start talking about work-life balance. Now, if you're not sure what I'm talking about with this, what I'm saying is there may be a time when you have to put in a lot of hours at work, and that's just because that's the season that your job is in. But then there's going to be times when you know, your wife is sick or kids are sick and you got to take care of the family. And those are going to be seasons. Now, these seasons don't always last a long time. In fact, I've gone through seasons where it's like, hey, this two weeks, I'm going to be doing this. And then this two weeks, I'm going to be doing this. And that's where the whole work-life balance thing kind of comes into play because there's this idea that we need to somehow find a way to keep our work and our life equal. And I just don't buy into that. Now, you don't have to agree with me on this, but the idea is you can balance the two because you have to do both of them, right? You have to exist in your family and take care of your wife, take care of your kids, but you also have to get a job and pay your bills and things of that sort. Here's the deal. Work-life balance is never equal, all right? It all comes with seasons. Let's go ahead and unpack the two things. Now, there are a ton of things. Like when I say a ton, there are a ton of things or a ton of ways that you could really address or approach the whole work-life balance uh, theory and concept. And I can make probably a month's long worth of uh, episodes talking about this because it's just so deep. 
But I want to keep it kind of surface level for this episode. And if that's something you want to see more of, send me an email or leave a comment if the platform you're listening to allows for a comment. All right. And say, hey, I want to know more about this work life balance. And I'll do what I can to get another episode out that goes a little bit further into work life balance. So the first one, your job is not the problem. Your job is not the problem to your work life balance. Okay. There are so many people that I've talked to, and I even used to believe this that my job is the reason that I'm just out of balance. And the truth is, it's not my job. My job does not take me out of balance. My job requires some things of me, and my job is very demanding, so much so that I have not been producing these podcasts. That is just the way it is. Why? Because I knew that if I'm going to perform well at my job, which is demanding, then I'm going to have to give up on some things. And the podcast was one of those things that I kind of pushed to the wayside as things started to pick up at my job. And I knew that I needed to perform well there. Again, that was within a season. That season was a little bit longer than that two week period that I talked about earlier, but it was still within a season. Now, your job may not be fulfilling you, and that's normal, but it does not control your ability to be a great husband. Just because you're not fulfilled in your job doesn't mean that you get to come home and take it out on your family or on your wife, all right? It just doesn't. That should go without saying, but I feel like I needed to start off with that for the whole your job is not the problem thing, because if... Many, many of the gentlemen that I've spoken to over the years, they have told me, well, my job, I don't feel fulfilled. So I come home with a bad attitude and I take that out on my family. And they almost say it like, give me a break type of deal. And I don't give men a break for that. All right. I get it. If you had a rough day at work, you come home and then you have to deal with some stress at home. Yes, I get that. However, Remember what's more important. The way that, you know, the men that I'm I'm coaching and the men that I uh, inspire on this podcast are men who want to grow their marriage and have their marriage for the long haul. I don't know of too many people who have a job for the long haul, right? It's just not the same. We jump from job to job. Unfortunately, there are some men out there that jump from marriage to marriage, but those are not the men that I'm trying to coach here on this podcast. I'm trying to coach the men that want to build their marriage that they're in right now and be in that marriage until the day that they die, holding true to their wedding vows. That is the type of man that I am trying to coach and inspire on this uh, this podcast, All right. With that being said, your job is not the problem, okay? Your job may not fulfill you. Doesn't mean you get to come home, take it out on your wife. Also, your job or jobs may not pay all of the bills, but it does not hinder your relationship with your wife, with a caveat, unless your wife got with you for your money, all right? Here's the reason why I bring this up. Your job may not pay all of the bills, and I understand so many people they're working multiple jobs, all right? It's a tough economy, and I, I, I've i heard all of the stories about how people have to get multiple jobs, and I understand that. And that can seem very heavy on the work aspect of what is required. However, let me tell you firsthand that just because that is the work aspect of it, you can still balance life working multiple jobs. And in some way, I'm here and I have quite a few uh, side ventures, if you will, that are not a part of my main job, the job that I do to pay all the bills, but I'm still able to manage everything that I need to. All right. So the, 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 this kind of breaks down into two things, right? First, you have the financial aspect, and then you also have the I'm working multiple job aspect. Let me take care, or I already talked about the multiple job aspect. It's going to seem like that's going to uh, over tip the scales in the job aspect or job side of things, but it really doesn't. You just have to find 
when and where, and we'll talk about some solutions to this, uh, when and where to do things with your family. On the financial aspect, right? Because I gave that caveat. Unless your wife is with you for your money, it's okay that your job doesn't pay all the bills. All right, let me say that again. It's okay that your job does not pay all the bills. The problem here really comes in with how do you communicate this to your family, to your wife, to figure out what you can do? And, you know, if your job is really not paying all the bills and you have to go get an extra job, then go get an extra job. That's a part of that whole work-life balance. That is that that really is the thing, right? Uh, sometimes we don't find jobs that pay every single bill. Uh, I would also say, look at what your means uh, of living are. Like, what is your cost of living? Are you paying for extra things that you probably really don't need? Are you down to the bare essentials? That's something that is probably worthwhile looking into for yourself, just so you know, all right? The other thing when it comes to your job is not the problem, is your job will demand things of you, but that does not mean you can neglect your wife, all right? My job demands a lot of me. My job makes me travel from time to time uh, more frequently than it has. That doesn't mean I get to neglect my wife. Many of you have heard me talk about this. I have daily, weekly, and monthly engagements with my wife where we do things. And sometimes it's not always grand. In fact, most of the time it's not grand. Uh, but my wife doesn't feel like I'm a stranger. Now, recently, uh, the reason why I had to step away from the podcast was because I was starting to step back on the things that I teach here on this podcast. And I said, I can't be a good steward of coaching husbands if I'm not practicing the things that I am coaching them on, which is why I said, you know what, I'm going to take some time, step back and go and really re-engage with my wife. It's not that our marriage was like on the rocks or anything crazy like that. But I realized that I was missing my wife in areas where I had normally always met her. So I wanted to make sure that I was meeting her where she was. Monthly, weekly, daily engagement with my wife is extremely important. Just because my job demands a lot of me does not mean that I get to neglect my wife. Doesn't mean that you get to neglect your wife either. All right. You're going to have to find time for her. You married her. You have to prove to her that you love her. I've heard many men tell me, well, my wife should just know. Well, how does she know? She's going to know based off of the, your, your actions. And if your actions do not capture the fact that you love her, she's not going to know it. She's going to have a theory, right? And we all know about theories like that until they're proven. It's purely just a thought. But when you prove it, then she has factual, hard data that says, OK, yes, he does love me. And that's what we're going to get into right now. How do you overcome the whole your job is not the problem thing? Well, here's the deal. Number one, you got to schedule your, your, your time. Schedule out your days, your months and your weeks. You can take this as extreme as you want to. Uh, or you can just take it like, hey, where are the big items on the calendar that I really need to pay attention to? And then start putting those on a Google calendar, on your phone, on your iCalendar, whatever, uh, on a physical calendar. Write them in, right? Doesn't matter. I'm not going to tell you which one, which way is best or which way is in any, any way, right? The point here is you want to start mapping stuff out. Once you have everything mapped out, then you'll come back and say, what is it that I need to do right now? This is really going back to when I when I taught in previous episodes about prioritizing the things that matter. So important that we learn to prioritize the thing that matter. Uh, I had a discussion with my wife about this earlier today about prioritizing things that matter. So Trust me, I'm not perfect at this, by the way, and I never want anyone to think like, oh, well, Chris, you're the husband coach. You have to be perfect at this. I am not. OK, I'm not. I am a husband that's growing and working every day to show my wife that I love her, to prove to her that I love her. So that way she doesn't have to second guess it. Anyhow, all that to say, you want to schedule your time and you want to safeguard your schedule. If something comes up as an opportunity, 
you have to say, okay, here's what's on my schedule. How much priority does the thing that just came up take over something that's on my schedule? If you find something that comes up and you really need to take that uh, or, you know, prioritize that or reprioritize, then go for it. But if it's something like that isn't very important, then you need to say no. I'll do a whole episode on the power of saying no to your schedule. The reason why you want the schedule is so you can be able to say no. The word no is such an amazing word. I love telling people no. And it's not because I'm like some pessimist or anything like that, even though my wife says I am. I'm not. Here's the deal. I love to tell people no because that means that I'm clear on what I know I have to say yes to. And when you get to that point in your scheduling, you have so much control and freedom. You you just don't even understand. For those of you who, who know what I'm talking about, you get it. All right. You really get it. If you're on YouTube, write down in the comment section, uh, write down freedom or just say no. That's what we'll go with. Write down in the YouTube comment section, just say no. All right. It makes sense. Second thing, overcoming the problem of your job. Schedule time for you to decompress. We started with scheduling. We're going into the whole decompress aspect of it. This is important because if you don't take time for yourself to decompress, you're going to run into burnout. Okay. And that burnout can happen at any given time. And we live in a time where mental health is really, really challenging. I've talked to a lot of men who are going through mental health issues uh, where, you know, suicide or self inflicted fatalities, things of that sort, it has crossed their mind in relationship to trying to balance their work and their life. Now, I don't want anyone to feel suggested on that. And, you know, just being real, if that is something you're struggling with, you got to call for help. All right. Go get help because there are ways of overcoming this. Okay. Now, with that being said, what you got to be able to do is find time to decompress. That could be going to the gym. That could be playing Xbox or PlayStation, whatever you may play. All right. If you play a video game, let me know in the comment section on YouTube what video game you play. There's so many things that you can do to decompress. I won't tell you what you must do. Just choose something and do it. It is important for you as an individual to grow in your marriage, to grow yourself and to help with that whole uh, stress between work and life. All right. Because guess what? Work is going to stress you and life is going to stress you. I'm focusing right now so much or much more on how your work may stress you, but you may need to decompress from issues that are going on in your life. Going to the gym could be that thing going somewhere else. The only thing that I would caution you on is don't turn to alcohol as your decompressor. All right. For obvious reasons, you probably don't want to do that. That's just a thought. So we already got schedule your day, weeks, months, and uh, days, weeks, and months, schedule your time to decompress. The third thing to overcome your job problem is going to be get more efficient in doing your job. I'm a supervisor and my whole existence of being a supervisor is to make sure that my team works efficiently. I sniff out inefficiencies in my office as well as I possibly can. Here's the reason why. If my team is not working efficiently, then they're going to get behind. And when they get behind, that's going to lead to stress. And when they get behind and it leads to their stress, I then have the burden and the stress of making sure that I figure out how to resolve that problem. As a supervisor, my job is not to as I tell my team, my job is not to push buttons and to do the, the simple task. That's what they're there for. I need them to do that. It's my job to be the task director and making sure that one person isn't getting more work than the other person as best as I can, as well as giving the right job to the right people and, and teaching people how to do the job better whatever it may be, 
Okay. You may not be a supervisor. You may be an employee. You may be a task doer. Learn how to do your task as best as you possibly can. When you learn how to do your task as best as you can, you are going to be more efficient and you're going to be less stressed. I'm going to give you some insight, right? Because what seems to happen is the person who does the best job always ends up with getting more work because that's just how supervisors see it. Because I'm aware of that, I know that I'm not giving more work to my team as someone's performing well. Uh, In fact, I usually say, hey, take a break, go do something else. Uh, And then I take on a little bit of that work while they're on a break or whatever it may be. Now, if you find that you're in a situation where you are not inspired to grow beyond where you are because you know that as soon as you get good at what you're doing, then you're going to get more work. One of two things needs to happen. Either one, you need to try and move into that supervisory position so you can set the conditions in your office or your workspace so that way those who are performing well, you can safeguard them and make sure that they don't get more work similar to what I do. Or two, what you can do is go and confront your boss respectfully and just say, look, check it out. I know that I'm doing really good, but you're overwhelming me with work. Don't be too proud to tell your boss that you are being overwhelmed, especially if you know you're going above and beyond with what it is that you were already supposed to be doing there. And two, you could also demand a higher salary if that's something that can be negotiated or a raise on your wages if that's something that can be negotiated. If they're like, hey, if they're seeing the value in you, then get your worth. I'm not going to get into uh, job coaching because that's not the, the point here, but that does that does help with your work-life balance because if you're getting paid your worth, then you feel more confident about going to, jo- to your job, which then that's going to build your self-esteem, that's going to build your confidence, and guess what? That trickles into your life. That trickles into your home, and you start to perform more for your family and ultimately building the love to your wife or towards your wife. All right. So yes, you should absolutely get paid your worth. The final thing when it comes to the job, and then we'll move to the next point is start working on an alternative job. Let's say you are not inspired to gain more efficiency in the current job that you're in, because it's just not one of those career builder type things. Got it. We all work jobs. I worked as a janitor, nothing against being a janitor, by the way. That's just something I did. I knew that that wasn't a career. That was something that I had to do to make ends meet. And I learned a skill. Okay. That's the way I looked at it. I learned a skill. Won't tell you what skill I learned, but I learned it. With that being said, what you want to do is start planning your next job. If you're not fulfilled in the job that you're in, start looking at what your next job is. Make a five-year plan if it if it's going to take that long, but whatever it may be, make a plan, build your transition, right? The reason you want to do this is because it starts to give you something to look forward to. You want to start building whatever it is that you want to go towards now, because if you wait, it is going to be a very, very sad day when you start seeing other people progress into things and stuff that is going to really impact your overall work life and impact your marriage, impact your relationship, impact your family. So make sure that if you're not fulfilled in the job you're in, start planning what your transition is and start executing on that. All right. Don't just plan it. Start doing things to move you towards it as best you can. I want to be very clear here. I'm not telling anyone that they need to quit their job walk out on their boss or do anything super stupid or crazy at work. Not what I'm saying. I'm absolutely not saying that. Instead, what I'm saying is think about what it is that you want to do, what you want to accomplish, how you want to accomplish it, and then start working towards that. And then eventually put in your notice if that's something that you need to do. I don't know, but that's something you got to figure out for yourself. When we start talking about transitions and making sure that you know where your next source of income is coming from, that really brings me to setting goals. And that's actually the second part of what I want to talk about in today's episode. So setting goals is one of those things kind of pie in the sky. But here's the deal. You got to set goals with your wife. 
I've talked about this in previous episodes. I know I keep referencing a lot to previous episodes, but here's the deal. You must set goals because the only way that you're going to know that you are on track to the thing that you're trying to get to is by setting a goal. Now, the goal setting is, you know, just one of those things that if you do it, you're going to do it well or you're going to be better off for doing it is what I really want to say. Also, goals keep you on track for really what you want to do or where you want to go. If you don't have a goal in mind, you're going to end up flying a course. Wherever you end up is where you want it to be anyway, because you didn't have a goal in mind. That doesn't make sense, all right? You have to have a destination. You have to have an idea of what you're working towards. Now, I'm not going to give you in this episode, I'm not going to give you uh, ideas or goals that you should set. Instead, what I'm going to do is tell you, number one, they should be meaningful to your marriage. And the only way that you're really going to be able to get to setting a meaningful goal in your marriage is by sitting down with your wife and saying, hey, what is it that we want to achieve in the next two years, three years, five years, whatever it may be? Doesn't really matter. Choose your time frame, set a goal for it. I do recommend that you set something that is relatively close uh, because you get a, 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 a jolt of energy, dopamine, excitement, fulfillment whenever you achieve a goal. There's some science behind that. I won't get into it, but just know that there is some science behind when you achieve a goal, it makes you feel better about yourself, makes you want to do more and you work harder and then you set a larger goal. And then next thing you know, you're like shooting to the moon and you're actually getting there. The point here, number one, make a goal that is meaningful to your marriage. Sit down with your wife and talk to her about it. Don't care what that goal is, but you and your wife, you two care about what your goal is. Number two, they should be appropriate to your marriage and not competitive or comparative, if that's even a word. Essentially, we don't want to compare to other people's marriages, right? They shouldn't be competitive in the regards of I'm trying to compete with someone else to make like to one up them. That's stupid. Don't do it. Don't one up people. It doesn't work. All right. And it also shouldn't be comparative to another person's marriage because that marriage is unique all on its own because those two people are unique all on their own. So make sure that when you set your goals, it's not competitive or comparative because when you do that, man, let me tell you, I've seen some people really have some problems. All right. When you start to compare your marriage to another marriage or when you start to compete with other marriages, it usually ends bad because you make bad decisions along the way. I witnessed a couple that they were competing against a different couple. The couple they were competing against didn't even know that they were competing, by the way. They didn't know. That couple was just minding their business and they were doing some things and it was what they wanted to do. And this other couple that was, you know, looking at them and saying, oh, yeah, we could do better than them and whatever. Well, they started making some dumb decisions and one one of them made a pretty stupid financial decision, which led to a relational decision that was stupid and ultimately led to a very, very stressful time in their marriage. All right. Trust me, you don't want to compete with other marriages. It's silly. It's stupid. It never works. All right. It just doesn't. Don't compete with another person's marriage uh, or another couple's marriage. It's not wise. Trust me, it is not wise. The third thing when it comes to setting goals, use milestones to keep you on track to your goal. Similar to completing the goal, the milestones are going to help you with giving that jolt of energy, that excitement. All right. So if you have a large goal, let's say one of your goals is to uh, buy a house as a couple. Okay. Well, what are some of the things we need to do in order to buy a house? Well, we need to save up $30,000. Just throwing out, you know, random numbers. We need to save up $30,000 so we can have a good down payment or whatever we're going to do. Okay. So then you build your, your milestone about that $30,000, right? But then you have to say, okay, how am I going to save $30,000? And then you start backwards planning. 
okay, how many years would it take me to get to 30,000? It'll take me five years to get to 30,000 if I save this much money each year. So then you start working that out. And every year you start looking at it and you start saying, okay, are we on track to 30K? Are we on track to 30K? Are we on track to 30K? And then once you get to that five-year mark and you hit 30K, you're going to be great. You're going to be like, okay, we're one step closer to buying our house because now we got the $30,000. And then you can figure out the rest of building milestones. But it's this process where you and your wife are working towards it, right? It's a goal that you and your wife are working towards together. And then, of course, you can put in micro uh, milestones where it's like, okay, we just hit 5,000. Yes. Get excited. Do something. Yes, we just hit 10,000. Get excited. Go do something that's responsible and, you know, not crazy. And all the way through. So that way, every time that you hit a uh, milestone that you set for yourself, you get a celebration and it makes you want to continue on until you get to that end state. And then eventually you buy a house and then it's great, right? Then maybe it comes down to, okay, we want to remodel or we want to go travel the world and backpack through whatever countries allow you to backpack. I don't know. All that stuff. Goal setting. I think we're clear. I think that's pretty straightforward. Today, we talked about two things, all right? We talked about setting goals and we also talked about your job is not the problem. Work-life balance is a big deal. If you don't take care of it sooner rather than later, then you're going to really start to uh, foster an environment in your marriage that you may not want to. And that could lead to bigger problems down the road. My advice is that you take this serious and you figure out what your work-life balance is. Create that schedule and guard it as best as you possibly can. Get to the point where you can just say no, because when you do that, you're going to have so much freedom. And it's going to help you with ultimately building the perfect work-life balance. So if you found value in the content, please smash the subscribe button if you're on YouTube, if you are on a different platform, whatever interaction allows you to follow, like, subscribe, whatever. Uh, that would be amazing because it helps with the algorithm and getting this podcast into the ears of those who would also benefit. Another way of getting this podcast into the ears of those who would benefit is if you would share it. I would greatly appreciate it and I welcome everyone and thank everyone who does share it. Now, if you got a question and you just want to get some quick advice, please hit me up in the uh, email in the show notes, or you can just email me husbandcoach2020 at gmail.com. Let me know what you think about the episode, or if you got questions, just let me know. So until next time, I want you guys to find a way to love your wife every day.